Padante kam Bandeham Shri Gara Shri Yatapada Kamalam Shri Garan Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sarvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitam Stya Hey Krishna Karana Sindhu Dhinna Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Goravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome everyone to this uh, fourth class on the Bhakti Shastri on the chapters 13 to 18 of Bhagavad Gita. So this evening we want to go through chapter 14. But before we do so, just a quick look or a quick revision of uh, what you covered, what you covered in the, uh, what happened with the 13th chapter just to keep it in your mind to refresh you. I'll just put it into screensaver and let you... Okay. So just a couple of questions. Maybe you know the answers immediately. Relationship between the individual soul and the super soul. Anyone like to volunteer? Mara is there uh, as a friend? Yeah, they're friends, right? And one is uh, uh, super soul is observer and permitter. Overseer, yeah, the overseer, the permitter. Overseer. Yeah, super soul, so overseer and the permitter. And they have a friendly relationship. Okay, good. That's something. What about the... Hare Krishna. Yes? Uh, super soul is the Chaitya Guru who awakens us. Okay, we get direction from the super soul. With is a Chaitya Guru, yeah, all right, very nice. And the second question, the analogy of the sun, given in verse 34, how did Krishna use this analogy? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, our sun is situated in, in one place in the universe and illuminates the whole universe. Oh, Similarly, the spirit soul, or uh, even though located in one small place in the body, mm -hmm. it eliminates the whole body by consciousness. Very good. Yes, very nice. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go ahead to chapter 14. It's not a very deep, not a very heavy philosophical chapter. It's dealing with the modes of nature. Let me see. I do have a PowerPoint on it. Wait, we should use it. Just let me find it. Go back into this. 
Okay, here we are. Oh, okay, okay, here's the headings on chapter 14. Just three sections. First of all, Krishna as the seed giving father for the first four verses. And then we'll go into the modes of nature to hear about the modes of nature the conditioning, characteristics, action, and what happens when we die in the modes. And then finally, transcending the modes. Prabhupada explains here from the first verse, first purport of the first verse, 14th chapter. It has also been explained that it is due to association with the modes of nature that the living entity is entangled in this material world. Now in this chapter, the Supreme Personality explains what those modes of nature are, how they act, how they bind, and how they can give liberation. And here's the key verse from the 13th chapter, describing the position of the living entity, right? We're the Purusha. We're thinking we're the Purusha and we're in the Prakriti. We're trying to enjoy the matter, the Prakriti. So, within the, from the Prakriti, the modes of nature are born. So, we, we come into contact with the modes of nature through the Prakriti. This verse in the 13th chapter leads to this discussion now in the 14th chapter about the modes of nature. Karanam guna sangasya sadasad yoni janmasu Right? Because we, are, we associate with the modes of nature, so we meet with good and evil in many different births. We're in this wheel of material existence, taking birth again and again. So this is the 13th chapter, the seed verse leading to the 14th chapter. Now, I want to begin the discussion on the 14th chapter. We want you to look at the purport here. In the 14th chapter, Prabhupada talks about, if we read the purport, Fourteenth chapter. Prabhupada writes there in the, this purport. See. From the seventh chapter to the end of the twelfth chapter, Sri Krishna 
in detail reveals the absolute truth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now the Lord Himself, now the Lord Himself is further enlightening Arjuna. If one understands this chapter through the process of philosophical speculation, he will come to an understanding of devotional service. So it's important for us to understand what is happening here when Prabhupada talks about the process of philosophical speculation because generally we criticize people for speculating. We say, don't speculate, you know. <laughs> so one, one young boy in the UK, he was reading this purport many years ago and he wrote to Prabhupada about this and he asked Prabhupada that, you know, why is it you say here in this purport that we should understand by the process of philosophical speculation? And I, I thought you always said we should not speculate. So Prabhupada was very pleased with this question from the young boy and he complimented him. And Prabhupada then explained what is meant. Prabhupada explains that philosophical speculation when you're guided by the mind is wrong. But when you're guided by Guru and Shastra, that is proper. So we have to understand this chapter through the process of philosophical speculation guided by our spiritual authority, by the spiritual teachers and by the Shastra. And then there's no problem, then there's no harm there. So you may make a note of this point here. The process of philosophical speculation is not wrong if we're, if we're guided in the proper way. Um, Prabhupada continues, in the thirteenth chapter it was clearly explained that by humb humbly developing knowledge one may possibly be free from material entanglement. It has also been explained that it is due to association with the modes of nature that the living entity is entangled in the material world. Now, in this chapter, the Supreme Personality explains what those modes of nature are, how they act, how they bind, and how they give liberation. Then Prabhupada goes on to, he says, the knowledge explained in this chapter is proclaimed by the Supreme Lord to be superior to the knowledge given so far in other chapters. Uh, we should understand this point correctly. I mean, superior to the knowledge given in other chapters in relation to the knowledge of the relationship between Prakriti and the Purush. In that way, it's the highest knowledge. Of course, we had chapter 9, Raja Vidya, the most confidential knowledge. But what, when, when Prabhupada writes here, and he's quoting Lord Krishna, you'll see in a verse, another verse to Krishna, we say this is the highest knowledge. So, yeah, high, highest knowledge in relation to this particular aspect of knowledge, the relationship between the Lord and the living entity in the material nature. Okay. We'll go ahead. Text number two. By becoming fixed in this knowledge, one can attain to the transcendental nature like my own. Thus established, one is not born at the time of creation or disturbed, or disturbed at the time of dissolution. Hmm? Text 
text number three. The total material substance called Brahman is the source of birth. And it is that Brahman that I impregnate, making possible the births of all living beings, O son of Bharata. So Prabhupada explains, this is an explanation of the world. Everything that takes place is due to the combination of the Shitra and the Shitragna, right? The body and the spirit soul. This, this combination of material nature and the living entity is made possible by the Supreme God Himself. So this is, this is a technical description here about what's happening, how creation comes about. Material substance, Brahman, right? This Brahman can have different meanings. In this particular case, they're talking about the material substance. The Mahatattva is the source of birth. And it is that Brahman that Krishna impregnates just simply by his glance. And in this way, the birth of the living beings take place. Right? Krishna does the creation, he, he is able to create all the living entities simply by his glance. He puts them into the material nature and they take a particular body according to their past karma. Remember in the previous verses we talked about it, according to the situation of the living entity, his desire and his karma, he will take a particular body. We describe the body to be like a residence. So different residences are there according to everyone's desire and qualification. And then we come to this very important verse here, verse number four. It should be. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, I have a doubt. Uh, can I ask Maharaj? Okay. Uh, Maharaj, in this uh, purport three towards the end, Prabhupada has written that thus every living entity according to his past activities has a different body created by his material nature. So the entity can enjoy or suffer. Yes. So enjoy here means that because of the fame, the beauty and the uh, material things he gets in that way, it is being said enjoy. Yes. The body, yeah, he enjoys the body, has a different body so that the living entity can enjoy. The enjoyment and suffering are coming through the body. So someone's got a, you know, very healthy, strong, handsome body and some others are not so fortunate. They're suffering, health problems, physical problems, inabilities, sometimes disabled. So this is all karmic reactions, yeah, living entities okay, put into these different bodies. Oh, just, while you bring me, bring me back, it's important, you can just look at that paragraph there in the purport. Prabhupada gives an, an important example which we should be familiar with, the, the example about scorpion lays its eggs in piles of rice. Sometimes it's said that the scorpion is born from the rice, but the rice is not the cause of the scorpion. The eggs are laid in the rice. So this is one type of logic which is used in the Vedic culture. This is called Tandula Vrishika Nyaya. Vrishika means a scorpion, right? So, so, we should understand that when the scorpion comes out of the rice, it is not just due to the rice that the scorpion is coming, but because another scorpion has laid eggs there, and the egg has fermented and hatched, 
and the scorpion has come. So in the same way, material nature is not the cause of the birth of the living entity. The seed is given by the personality of Godhead and they only, the living entities only seem to come out as a product of matter. So this, this is an important example to be understood that we're all spiritual beings, we're, we have a spiritual particle, we, have, we are spirit souls and our body is just the, the vehicle for the soul. So the body is arranged according to our past deeds. It's not that we're simply a product, that it's not that life comes from matter, but life comes from God Himself. We have to understand the origin of life. Materialistic, atheistic people, they're thinking life is coming from chemicals. They're thinking it's all coming about due to combination of chemicals. But this is not the fact. Life is due to the spiritual particle, the soul. And so this example of the scorpion laying the eggs and the rice is very appropriate in uh, presenting this kind of example to understand. Okay, so text number four. Very important verse. Is it one of your memorization verses? Mm, no more. Uh, yes, Maharaj. It, it, it is a surprising verse, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an important verse. Uh, we, we'll look at it. It should be understood that all species of life, O son of Kunti, are made possible by birth in this material nature and that I am the seed-giving Father. So, some important points to be understood in this verse. Actually, we want you to have a look at this verse yourself and just spend a few minutes to... Let me show you here. You can see... Uh, uh, okay. Here's a... We call this... Uh, Theological application exercise. If you read through the verse and the purport, we want you to consider some of the different issues which this verse can be used to address. Is everyone seeing the question? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so we... Yes, Maharaj. We would like you to read through the purport and just jot down a few th points which we could use in, by way of dealing with different social issues, moral, moral issues, scientific or theological issues, different ways in which you, this verse could be used to address uh, some issues which come up in the modern world. Can you just take two minutes to just think about this for yourselves? See if you can come up with some points.
Okay, As, have you got some ideas on this? How could this verse be used in dealing with social issues? Maharaj? Yeah. Uh, Maharaj, one thing that I uh, just thought about once hearing this was that uh, if, if Krishna is the seed giving father of all the living entities, then one thing that uh, needs to be checked is animal slaughters and animal killing. Yes, very good. Because, uh, right. Yeah. Yes, because they're also they're our brothers and sisters, right? Yes, there's like universal brotherhood. Right, so. exactly. Very nice. Yes, right. Because Krishna is saying he's the seed giving father of all yes. of all species all species of life. Sarva Yonishu Kuntiya. All species of life. Krishna is saying Sarva Yonishu. So all the different species. They're all we're all one family with one father. And so certainly the, the case for animal slaughter is not supported by this verse. It shows the, 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 the wrong and the, the, the seriousness in killing animals. There is a, a, a great sin on the part of man to slaughter animals. Okay. Any other points? Thank you. Uh, I I um, I I was uh, thinking like um, since life comes from God, which is again a moral and moral or you can say theological issue. So since life comes from God, life is sacred. So it should be respected. It's actually in context of what we were talking just now that we have to respect everyone, whether it is animal, another living being, human being plants, trees, whatever. So everything uh, originates from God. Um, it, sh it is sacred and it should be respected and taken care of. Right. Yes, good. And what about when we come to different theories about the origin of life? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare. Maharaj, uh, Prabhupada also is writing that uh, life is existing not only on this planet but every planet. So when we say original life, like coming from molecular water uh, microbes, but it is everywhere, it is always existing even in fire and water. So and there is no uh, material origin to life. Oh, there's, there's no material origin to life. So, so, in other words, we say life does not come from chemicals. Yes, yes, Professor. Right. Yeah, there, there's a, a creator behind the creation, right? There's some intelligent creator who's responsible, who's done the work of creation. We say life comes from God, doesn't come from chemicals. We give, you give, yes, yes. You, we can give many chemicals. But nobody can. Okay, good. Yes, also, uh, you, the other lady made the point how we have to respect all forms of life. So, this makes a very strong case for ahimsa, for non violence. You know, the. There's a, a, a lot of violence, unnecessary violence in the world. And the, you can see that if we see all species of life as our brothers and are what, from what, under one, fa one father, then we'll have a respect for life. And that will make a big difference to the environment and to the social, to the conditions in which we're living today. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, under the theological issues, uh, can we say that uh, 
the, even though there are different religions, but in the end we are all related as brothers. So there's no point fighting on different religions because the father is one. Ah, yes, very nice, yes. So when it comes to inter-religious dialogue, we can, you know, we, we, we have a, a lot to contribute to people because we're, we're not against other religions. We, we see all different religions as presenting the truth in different ways. And uh, we don't discriminate against people for having different beliefs. But we understand there's one father, but he has many different names. So in this way, we respect people. And you can see also Lord Krishna is saying, He's the father of all living entities. So sometimes people, they may challenge that, oh, this is Indian or this is Hindu. But, you know, the word Hindu or Indian is not there in the Bhagavad Gita, you know. And K Krishna said, Krishna doesn't just say he's the father of, of the Hindu. He's the father of all living entities. And so it's certainly non-sectarian. Krishna, the Krishna conscious message is non-sectarian, it's for people of all beliefs and people in all different paths, they can benefit by reading Bhagavad Gita and hearing the teachings of Lord Krishna. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, wait, where is it? Here's some... Uh, the point, different points which we came up. Here's another point, Mother Nature. So respect for the environment, because the environment, the, the, we, we speak about Mother Nature, just like we have a father, we have also a mother, and material, the nature is there. So we will have respect in dealing with the environment. We can see how much we've ruined the environment with pollution, so many different ways, the rivers have been polluted, the forests have all been cut and destroyed, just in the name of what people call economic development. They say progress, but they don't say where they're progressing to. And then evolution theory, you know, that we talked about that, universal brotherhood. Okay, so pretty much we covered all these points. Good, you got these points yourself. Very fine. The, Maharaj, yeah. the last point, the purport, the, the purport is that the material world is impregnated with three living entities who come out in various forms at the time of creation according to their past deeds. Uh, so this proves that the, all the species are being uh, made by the Lord and he impregnates as per the karma in particular species. So as the Darwin's uh, evolution theory of living came from the monkey is condemned here like that? Yes, right. Yes, Darwin's theory that we've evolved from the monkeys is not true. No, not at all. We, we take birth in the world according to our particular karma which we had from the previous life. Because we're all eternal souls, so we, we take the situation which we come into, which we inherit in this birth, is the result of our past life. And somebody's in a monkey body, that's the result of their past life also. It's their past karma, to put them into that animal body. It's the type of punishment which people get for not controlling their senses. Hmm. So Darwin's, Darwin's he had a theory it was never proved. There's no real evidence to support it. It was simply a theory, a spec, you know, his own speculation from his own mind. No, no real evidence to support it. But, you know, atheistic people were very encouraged by it and they promote it. It encourages people in the life of sense gratification. Materialistic lifestyle is supported. So materialists, they like to promote their atheistic theories. We have to keep preaching. 
to convince people what is actually the truth. Okay, we'll go ahead here. Let's look at this PowerPoint. Uh, okay, 13.22. Material nature consists of three modes, right? Sadvam rajas tamat iti guna prakriti sambhava. We contact the prakriti, the material nature, and from that material nature, three modes are there, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And when we come in contact with the material nature, Krishna is saying, he becomes conditioned by these modes, by association. Just like we associate with someone who has some kind of habit, we will also pick up the habit from someone. So we reflect the qualities of the things we associate with. So the living entity comes in contact with material nature, and he becomes conditioned by these modes. We're going to look. That's text number five. Uh, let's look in here. Let's see. So then Krishna goes on to describe the type of conditioning which is there with each mode. Right? Here you can see. <laughs> here you can see the description of what happened. Verses 6 to 10 describe the conditioning which we acquire. First of all, the nature of the mode of goodness. Described here, being purer than the others is illuminating, frees one from all sinful reactions. Those situated in that mode become conditioned by a sense of happiness and knowledge. So this is, it sounds nice, but this is the problem, the condition in the mode of goodness. Because, because he's got some knowledge and because, he, because of that knowledge and because he's in better condition than others, so he has a sense of happiness. And that sense of happiness makes it difficult for him to go on further. Because he's in the mode of goodness, but you should understand that goodness is mixed goodness. It's not fully pure. It's contaminated by the other modes. So Prabhupada explains here in the purport, we'll just read a little bit from Prabhupada's purport. At the end of the first paragraph, this sense of happiness is due to understanding that in the mode of goodness, one is more or less free from sinful reactions. In all the Vedic literature, it is said that the mode of goodness means greater knowledge and a greater sense of happiness. But then Prabhupada goes on, the difficulty here is that when a living entity is situated in that mode of goodness, he becomes conditioned to feel that he is advanced in knowledge and is better than others. In this way, he becomes conditioned. Then Prabhupada gives examples about people in the mode of goodness. He says, scientists, philosophers, they have a lot of knowledge, generally well-educated, they have a, you know, good living standard, and so they have a sense of material happiness. Hmm. And similarly, a brahmana. A brahmana is also in the mode of goodness. Brahmana is not necessarily a pure devotee, but he's in the mode of goodness. But, I, as I said, the mode of goodness is also mixed 
with sometimes passion and sometimes ignorance. This is the problem. Hmm. So Prabhupada said, then says at the end of the purport, Thus there is no likelihood of liberation or of being transferred to the spiritual world. Repeatedly one may become a philosopher, a scientist or a poet and repeatedly become entangled in the same disadvantages of birth and death. But due to the illusion of the material energy, one thinks that that sort of life is pleasant. What do you think? Do you think it's pleasant? Can you understand? No, Maharaj, it's not pleasant. Mm. It's just condition. He thinks he's in a pleasant situation. Right. But actually he's entangled. He's entangled. Birth and death. He may come again and again and again in the, in the mode of goodness, but again, old age, disease and death, birth and death, birth and death. And this happens to people. They take birth again and again. Because, you know, some people fall in love with playing the piano and they, they, uh, and they just come back again and again just to play their musical instrument or to write their poetry or to paint their pictures. It's not very good. It's not the real goal of life. This is the nature of the mode of goodness. Okay, text 7 goes on to describe the mode of passion. Born of unlimited desires and longing. And because of this, the embodied living entity is bound to material fruit of actions. So the mode of passion means a lot of hankering for material enjoyment. We, they want very badly sense gratification. They want some honour in society or maybe in, on a bigger scale in the nation. He wants to have a happy family with nice children, wife and home. These are the products of the mode of passion. As long as one is hankering after these things, he has to work very hard. Therefore, it is clearly stated here that he becomes associated with the fruits of his activities and thus becomes bound by such activities. Prabhupada continues, in order to please his wife, children and society and to keep up his prestige, one has to work. Therefore, the whole material world is more or less in the mode of passion. Modern civilization is considered to be advanced in the standard of the mode of passion. <laughs> you know, the mode of passion is it's so attractive to people these days. You see it advertised everywhere. I saw there, there was one restaurant, I, I noticed, and they had a big sign on the window of the restaurant that said, come and taste the passion. And then there was another advertisement for a new car and they said, feel the passion. You know, so they promote this passion. It's a very common word used in advertising industry. It's so attractive to people. They think passion will be exciting and pleasing. They have no idea of what actually entails by association with the mode of passion. Now after reading this chapter today, you have a bit more knowledge yourself about the re why we should avoid the mode of passion. Because the results from the mode of passion is simply distress and misery. Let's just continue here. The mode of ignorance is described in text number 8. It's the complete opposite of the mode of goodness. The mode of goodness is illuminating, the mode of, the mode of ignorance is darkness, madness, indolence, sleep. 
So like that, just the opposite. People are lazy, dirty, they don't want to do anything, and they're crazy people. So it's a mode of ignorance. Maharaj Hare Krishna. Uh -huh. Can I ask something, Maharaj? Okay. Regarding this passion, um, Maharaj, uh, if devotees want to serve uh, a, a lot to the other devotees or the, or the Lord also, you know, uh, it, it, can it be considered as passion or uh, how do... Well, when you serve, that? serving the devotees, that is not material. You're, you're serving, you're doing some service for devotees, so that's a spiritual activity. Devotees, but you, you, you're rendering service to devotees, it's not a material activity. You're not going to get karma for that. You're going to get spiritual blessings. You're going to get advancement in spiritual life by serving devotees. So, Maharaj, uh, keeping passion to serve the duties is okay? Yes, uh, well, <laughs> why would it be passion? You, you know, why will you be so passionate in serving the devotee? In what way will you portray the passion? You, passion means you have a strong, always, a strong desire, al right? You yes, strongly, always hankering, always hankering to serve the duties. That's very good. That's not material, that's spiritual. It's a spiritual desire, it's not a material desire. The word so getting anger is a ignorance, getting anger is ignorance. Oh yes, becoming angry. Yeah, so if ever, if ever someone are, uh, you know, blaspheming the Lord or the devotees and we get angry, so that the mode of ignorance, well, so we are using it for the that can also be proper use of anger because somebody is blaspheming the devotees or blaspheming Krishna and so you can defend the devotees and you can defend Krishna by using your anger. Just like Arjuna used his anger in the battle of Kurukshetra and Hanuman used his anger in the battle of Lanka. They, they used their anger in the service of the Lord. So you can also use your anger to defend the devotees and to defend the honour of Krishna. But you should be careful in using, you, be, before you try to use anger, you should be able to control your mind and senses. The anger should not degrade you. Yes, Maharaj. If the anger puts you into the mode of ignorance and you become overwhelmed by this situation and you lose control of your mind and senses, then it's not good. Sometimes, you know, you get so angry, you get so, and it takes you a while to calm down. You know, it shouldn't really be like that. But you may, you know, you may voice your disapproval at someone for being offensive to the devotees or to Krishna. You have to be careful how you use anger. Because as described in Bhagavad Gita, it's described that when we become attached to something, we want to enjoy it. If we don't get it, we become angry. So you may not get the honour or respect you want, you may become angry. But when we become angry, then we lose our intelligence and the memory is lost and we fall into the pool of material existence. So we fall down into, the, into ignorance. It's not, that's not good. But anger can be used by qualified persons in the service of Krishna. You just have to be cautious about how you use it. You know, if you, if you get angry at your child, it's not very good. <laughs> you have to control your anger in that situation. So, just be careful about trying to use anger. Let's go ahead. Text number nine is like a summary.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Can I ask one question, Maharaj? Go ahead. Uh, Maharaj, as uh, one Prabhu asked that when we are serving the devotees, uh, uh, it is not passion. But while we are serving, when we expect something in return, like uh, some good comments or something like that, so does that become a passionable thing then? That is in the mode of passion then? Well. Or when we are serving, something doesn't go well, we get a bit upset or something like that. So does that become in the mode of a passion then? Mm -hmm. it, it can do. Sometimes things may go wrong and we have to, you know, we, we get a bit upset, but we, we, sh we have to control the mind. We have to understand, well, you know, Krishna, somehow Krishna didn't allow this event to work out exactly as I wanted. And we have to be detached. You know, sometimes Prabhupada would also get upset and disappointed, but he would always you know, one minute he's upset, next minute, okay, you know, we have to go on. You have to improve it. Be careful. Don't do this again. Don't let this happen again. So like that. So we shouldn't be overwhelmed for a long time. We shouldn't be upset for a long time. We have to be detached. You understand my point? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we would do things wrong, Prabhupada would, oh, you know, you know, not, not enough flowers or we haven't organized properly, and so Prabhupada would be upset and then he says, okay, do something about it, you know. And then he, he just, you know, he could, could he would, he could accept, he could, he could adjust to the situation. So we have to learn to be uh, we have to control the mind and sometimes we have to be detached from these situations. They may not go exactly as we want it, but we have to go on with life. That's the idea. Hmm. So, uh, just a little bit there in text number 8 about the person in the mode of ignorance. It said, Prabhupada writes, uh, they're, this is madness. In their madness, they are very reluctant to make advancement in spiritual understanding. Such people are very lazy. When they are invited to associate for spiritual understanding, they are not much interested. They are not even active like the man is controlled by the mode of passion. Thus another symptom of one embedded in the mode of ignorance is that he sleeps more than is required. Six hours of sleep is sufficient, but a man in the mode of ignorance sleeps at least 10 or 12 hours a day. Such a man appears to be always dejected and is addicted to intoxicants and sleeping. These are symptoms of a person conditioned by the mode of ignorance. Okay, so that's tamagun. People in the mode of, you know, the majority of people are strongly influenced by the mode of passion and ignorance. So text number nine summarizes, passion conditions one to good, to, to happiness. Uh, goodness, rather, conditions one to happiness. Passion conditions one to fruitive action. And ignorance covering one's real knowledge binds one to madness. Then text 10 describes how there's competition between the modes. Sometimes the person may be in the mode of goodness, but he may be influenced by passion or ignorance. You know, somebody may be a very brahminical kind of person and he may have a nice sadhana, but then someti sometimes he just says, oh, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to sleep all day and, you know, <laughs> we don't do any chanting, we just lay and sleep all day, fully in the mode of ignorance. And sometimes a person may be a very good person, may get very angry, big temper. Can, they're angry for a long time. So like this, 
the modes of nature are there. Even sometimes people in the mode of ignorance, they show sometimes the mode of goodness. I remember sometimes when we would go for book distribution, you know, we would go into somewhere where people are drinking alcohol and we would distribute books and they would give donations and take books happily. But sometimes we go to people who are very uh, much in the mode of goodness and they have no interest. <laughs> they have no interest in our books. So, it, so the modes of nature are like that. There's always a competition between the modes. We don't know what mode of nature people are going to be in from one moment to the next. They're under the control of the modes. Okay, then text 11 to 13 describes more the characteristics and symptoms. 11 to 13. Goodness means all the gates of the body are illuminated by knowledge. All right? He can see things the right way. This is the nature of the mode of goodness. Prabhupada writes, uh, one can taste things in the right position. One becomes cleansed inside and out. So this is the mode of goodness. The mode of passion, there's an increase. In, uh, when there's an increase in the mode of passion, the symptoms of great attachment, fructivity, intense endeavor, uncontrollable desire and hankering develop. Right? Sometimes people are like that due to the mode of passion, working intensely. They have such a strong desire to enjoy the material world and to achieve their results, and to see all their plans fructified. And then 13, when there's an increase in the mode of ignorance, then darkness, inertia, madness, and illusion manifest. Just the opposite. 14 and 15 describe the destination at death. You die in the mode of goodness, you go to the higher planets. All right? That's very nice. You go up. You go up. You die in the mode of passion, you'll come back again on this place, on the planet where passionate people are living. And you die in the mode of ignorance, you take birth in the animal kingdom. These are the different destinations for people and the different modes. You know, you die in the mode of passion, somebody's driving their car, racing very fast, high speed. That's the mode of passion. Somebody else dies in the mode of goodness. They may go to Benares with their family and they're fasting and preparing for death. They understand their body is coming to an end. They're surrounded by people reading scriptures and maybe chanting the holy name, that is certainly a nice way to leave the world. But if somebody leaves the world, in, they may be intoxicated, then that's the mode of darkness, the mode of ignorance. Not good. Maharaj. Yes. I have a question. What about if someone dies because of some disease, like say uh, some, some, some disease, one acquires some disease, for example, cancer or something, and then he or she reaches the, the last stage or something, uh, he's not fully conscious and um, maybe he, he or she may go to die. So what, what, how would we, which category would this person would come in? Well, it, it, recently we had one devotee, he left his body in Vrindavan. He'd been suffering from cancer for some time and he came to Vrindavan to leave the body. And uh, he, he, he was very determined, he didn't want to 
become too much intoxicated with drugs, you know, because the cancer was painful, but he tried to minimize the amount of drugs which he took to relieve him of the pain. So that made it easier for him to be more conscious, because ideally one wants to leave consciously, although it's not always possible, but it's certainly better if one can be more conscious and if one can avoid the heavy drugs which uh, take away the pain and the turmoil which is there in that, in that condition. So, Srila Prabhupada, for example, he told us, <laughs> I remember, because Prabhupada was already 80, over 80, and he, he knew his health was failing, so the devotees who were caring for Prabhupada, they brought him back to Vrindavan, and he was very glad to be back in Vrindavan. And Prabhupada had told devotees also, he said, don't give me to the doctors. <laughs> because Prabhupada had experience already when he had gone to New York, at that time he was 70, he had gone to New York, he had some problem and the devotees took him to the hospital. And he, Prabhupada, you know, he saw what they do in the hospital, how it's all needles and tubes and tests, and you know, different tests, test this, test that, take some blood to, to check the stool and the urine and all this, you know, so many tests. And Prabhupada said he, he didn't want that. He didn't want that you just give him to the doctors. He just wanted to leave the world in the association of devotees. So that's you know, that's ideal, but not everybody is able to do that. And you often find, you know, due to family pressure, the, the family, they want, you know, put father or put mother in the hospital, and they even they will put them in the ICU and things like this. And, you you know, they're put in there and then they're given so many drugs and tubes and things like this. It's not the best kind of condition to leave the world. So what happens to people who live in, in that condition? Well, the time of death, you know, uh, it depends also on what they've done throughout their life, how they've lived their life. At the time of death, then whatever we've done throughout our life, that will come into our mind at the end of life. So that's also very important. It's not only just, you know, your condition at the end of life, but also what, what have we done throughout our life and how much have we, you know, performed good activities and how much have we performed sinful activities. So, you know, you're going to get the resultant of that. Maharaj, I have one question. Hare Krishna. Yes. Yeah, means uh, now as per the karma, means uh, when we do some bad karma, so at the end, or before in our previous life also, if we do some bad karma, due to the result, we face some disease. And in that disease, we are facing certain problems of pain or something like that. And when we take medicine to counteract at that, do we are interfering the uh, karma? Means uh, to, as we are reducing the pain, uh, no. as we uh, face the pain, our karma will get reduced. But if we are taking medicine to reduce the pain, does the karma has been adulter ad you know, is there some adulteration of karma? Yes, I understand your question. Yes. Uh, uh, Generally, what we say is that the, the karma will come some other way. You know, if you use, you use your money to take some medicines to take away the pain, but the, the, the reaction is going to come in some other manner. 
If it's not going to come in the form of the disease, the, the material nature will find some other way to give us the punishment that we deserve for what we've done. That's how material nature works. So we may not get the disease problem, but we'll get some other problem. Okay, well, okay. We can't avoid the reactions from the material nature. You know, we may, be, we may be able to escape from the government and their police officers and so on, but we can't escape from the laws of the Supreme Lord. He has his agents, he has his law enforcement people everywhere. And so, therefore, we have to be very conscious, very careful. That's why a devotee is very careful to avoid sinful activities, because we know it's going to bring reactions. Yeah. Okay, so 1415 at the time, the, the destination at death, and then 16 to 18, the results of action. So, uh, 16 and 17 are related actually. Verse 16 and 17 are uh, interesting verses. Uh, let's look at 16 first of all, results of action. Pious action is pure, said to be in the mode of goodness. But action done in the mode of passion results in misery. And action performed in the mode of ignorance results in foolishness. So Prabhupada discusses some interesting points in his purport here. Uh, he talks about uh, particularly activities in the mode of passion and he describes how people may work very hard to put up buildings. He says to, to build a big skyscraper, you know, a big, or a big condominium apartment or some kind of multi-story building. You know, they go to great efforts to put up these big buildings. They have to dig into the ground and put in a very strong foundation. And they have to have so much money. They need so much finances to construct these buildings. No, it takes so much effort. You see, sometimes they begin the building, they're not able to complete it because they run out of money. The money is not enough. So this is, uh, you know, the, the, the nature, the mode of passion. Prabhupada writes there in the purport, the first paragraph of text number of the purport of 16, the financier has to take much trouble to earn a mass of money. And those who are slaving to construct the, the building have to render physical toil. The miseries are there. Thus Bhagavad Gita says, in any activity performed under the spell of the mode of passion, there is definitely great misery. They may, there may be a little so-called mental happiness, thinking, I have, I have this house, I built this house by my money, I have this house or this money, but this is not actual happiness. Hmm. It's not real happiness. People are not happy. They may have a building, they may have money, it doesn't mean they're happy. You see, you see so many people like that. They have so much money, they have so many buildings, they're always in anxiety, they're always miserable, they have no real pleasure. They do not know what is real happiness. Uh, then Prabhupada talks more about the mode of passion and ignorance. If you go into the further on in the paragraph, in the purport there, uh, 
second paragraph of text 16, Prabhupada talks about slaughtering poor animals, also due to the mode of ignorance. Animal killers do not know in the future the animal will have a body suitable to kill them. That is the law of nature. In human society, if one kills a man, he has to be hanged. That is the law of the state. Because of ignorance, people do not perceive that there is a complete state. Control, there's, a, there's a complete state controlled by the Supreme Lord. Every living creature is a son of the Lord and he does not tolerate even an ant's being killed. One has to pay for it. So indulgence in animal killing for the taste of the tongue is the greatest kind of ignorance. So you can see this is of course, this, this is powerful words from Srila Prabhupada. He's very concerned about this, you know, animal. And particularly, then Prabhupada goes on to talk about killing cows. He said, cow slaughter is an act of the greatest type of ignorance. In the Vedic cult, in the Vedic literature, the world's... What is it? The world's go beer... Oh, the, oh, the words, go be privit... Pranita Matsaram indicate that one who being fully satisfied by is desirous of killing the cow is in the greatest ignorance. So cow killing, sometimes they say you have to be killed for every hair on the body of that cow if they kill the cow. It's a very sinful act. To kill a cow is like killing a person. And sometimes people kill not just one cow, but they make a business of killing cows. And everyone involved in the slaughtering of animals is guilty. The people who raise the cows for slaughter, the people who transport them, the people who sell the meat and the people who purchase the meat, they're all involved. They're all taking the sinful reactions. So this is the mode of ignorance. People are deep in this mode, killing the cows. Prabhupada writes then at the end of the paragraph, a civilization which guides the citizens to become animals in their next life is certainly not a human civilization. The present human civilization is, of course, grossly misled by the modes of passion and ignorance. It is a very dangerous age, and all nations should take care to provide the easiest process, Krishna consciousness, to save humanity from the greatest danger. This is, you know, very much modern mission. Prabhupada was very concerned, very compassionate on people. You can see Prabhupada preaching very strongly there about the, the evils of this modern civilization. Okay, then text 17. From the mode of goodness, real knowledge develops. From mode of passion, greed develops. And from the mode of ignorance develops foolishness, madness and illusion. And then Prabhupada speaks about these different activities. In the purport uh, purpo of text 17, I will just read a little. 
In the mode of ignorance, for example, they do not see that by killing one animal, they are taking the chance of being killed by the same animal in the next life. Because people have no education in actual knowledge, they become... Haribo, what's happening? To stop this irresponsibility, education for developing the mode of goodness. Do you have the number? Is that Mark? Do you have the number? Is that Mark? Is that Mark? Is that He's on the call. I think maybe he's on the show. Maharaj, Hare Krishna, we lost your voice. Oh, really? We can't hear you. Really? Let me see what's going on. I don't know why. Let me check. Yeah. From last three minutes, we didn't hear heard anything from you. Really? I think also we lost you. Huh? We couldn't hear you. From... Can you hear Click. me? You can hear me now? <laughs> Are you hearing me yes, now? Can... Yes. Oh. Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Are you there? Hare Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. We can. No. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So I'm going through these sixteen and seventeen, describing the nature of the the modes of nature. Prabhupada talking about the results which come from these different actions, from the mode of goodness, you know, people get real knowledge, results in piety, pious activities, and the mode of passion and ignorance, it's a lot of problems, they get trouble, they get reactions. I was I was reading some of the Prabhupada's quotes there, particularly. Did you hear the, the quote at the end of verse 16 in the purport? Did you did I did you, could you hear it? Are you there? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes Maharaj. Did you hear that last? Which seventeen you got disturbance? Seven? Yeah, we lost you only from seventeen. Oh, from seventeen you lost me. Okay. So there there was a section there I, I wanted to read. Prabhupada was talking about the need for education. He said, when people are actually educated, when people are actually educated, halfway through the paragraph of text 17, when people are actually educated in, in the mode of goodness, they will become sober in full of things as they are. Then people will be happy and prosperous, even if the majority of the people aren't happy and prosperous, if a certain percentage of the population develops Krishna consciousness and becomes situated in the mode of goodness, then there is a possibility of peace and prosperity all over the world. What do you think of that? Hare Krishna? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> just Prabhupada saying, just a small percentage of the population, if they will become Krishna conscious, it can have such a good effect on the whole planet. You know, we can't expect everyone to become a vegetarian. We can't expect all these people to stop doing all the things they're doing. But we want, we have to show the example, we have to, we have to try to inspire people, to show them what is the proper standard for human life. So Prabhupada gives very nice descriptions there and he's, you can see he's emphasizing the need to cultivate the mode of goodness. That's very important. We have to cultivate the mode of goodness. 
come up to the mode of goodness and then devotional service is so much easier. Of course, you can become Krishna conscious anywhere, but if we're in the mode of passion and ignorance, it's more difficult to come up to the mode of good goodness. Okay, so text 18 again, pro, uh, Krishna's talking about the destination. Maharaj, uh -huh. Maharaj can I ask something? Uh -huh. From text 17, it says that uh, from the mode of goodness, a real knowledge develops, yeah? Yeah. Now, this real knowledge is uh, Krishna conscious knowledge, so it's real knowledge. Yes. So, is it always true the people who are in the mode of goodness that they'll always uh, go towards the real knowledge and uh, then they will get delivered, is not it? Well, it's not necessarily true, but we were saying some people they're in the mode of goodness, but they're not actually devotees. They're attached to being in the mode of goodness. They're attached to having knowledge. They're attached to being better off than other people. You know, they're, they're, they may be proud, I'm a vegetarian, or I'm a Brahmin by birth, you know, I'm a Brahmin by birth, I have a good birth. And they're happy, they're very clean and pure, sattvic, you know, moral, but they're not devotees. They don't do devotional service. So they don't come to the platform of pure goodness. They're in the mode of goodness, but it's mixed with passion and ignorance. So they have some knowledge, and that knowledge can also be, you know, adulterated, can be mixed with their own understanding. Oh, they think, oh, it's not so important to chant the holy name. Oh, it's not so important to worship the deity. Oh, you don't have to do like that, you know. There's so many things, you know, they compromise. You know, they're just, they're in the mode of goodness. Sometimes, not all the time. So they have some knowledge, they have some understanding, but it's mixed with their own ideas, their own thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Maharaj, in the same context, so there are many, there are many wise people, there are many wise saints who serve uh, other individuals, who serve a uh, um, uh, what a uh, uh, entire group of a community. They serve them. So when they serve them, it's as good as they are serving many souls. But yes, as you rightly mentioned, they are still in the mode of goodness. Maybe they, they are expecting some fruitive results. So are we trying to say that because they are not in devotional service, still they do not fall in this category? They have not completely surrendered? Well, that, yes, certainly they've not surrendered. They've not surrendered. You know, and they're not interested to surrender. They're just interested to be in the mode of goodness. You know, they're just interested to have their, their so-called mode of goodness, you know. It's not, as I said, it's not 100% the mode of goodness, because there's some passion and there's some ignorance also mixed in there. But, you know, there's a show of the mode of goodness, predominantly the mode of goodness, but not devotee. Not no no question of surrender. Not not ready. Not even thinking about surrendering <laughs> to Krishna. You know, they have their own thinking. You no know, happy, enjoy life, enjoy the world, be happy, be comfortable, and they don't think about death. They don't think about life being temporary. So this is a problem. Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, just a, a small doubt. Uh, what about uh, Mayavadis? If they are in the mode of goodness, so what is their destination? Well, Mayavadis gen generally, if they're not offenders to the Lord, then they can enter into the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. They go into the Brahma Jyoti. They don't, they, you know, they get Sayujya Mukti merging into the Brahma Jyoti. 
and they will stay there for some time. You know? Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. But they won't stay there forever. And so they come back into the material world and Mayavadis, they take up welfare activities because they don't have any real understanding of what are spiritual activities. They think rather all activities are material. And so they take up welfare activities, doing social programs, open a school, open a hospital, some kind of home like that, maybe for orphans or something. And they do this kind of work, this is welfare activity. It's not spiritual activity, not fully spiritual. But for them, you know, it's more the goodness. That's where they're at. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, such, such uh, Mayavadi uh, souls who are in Brahma Jyoti, uh, as they can't stay for a long time there, they have to come down to the uh, material world. But if they get the uh, uh, the spiritual understanding of the Lord, are, without coming to the material world, are they being transferred to the a spiritual world or they have to come back again to the world for, for, for any purpose? For the, even for spiritual purpose they have to come down? Yeah, it's described that they may be in the Brahma Jyoti and they may hear, they may see the Sankirtan movement. Some Sankirtan devotees may be going by and they may be attracted to the Sankirtan. So they can come from the Brahma Jyoti and they can join the Sankirtan and they can go into the spiritual planets. So they don't need to come back into the material world if they're attracted to the Sankirtan. Yeah. That's the mercy of Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, one more question. Uh, is it correct to say that all living entities are uh, three modes of uh, n uh, material nature is there in all living entity, like goodness, passion, and ignorance? And if the goodness is always predominant, they will move towards this real knowledge. Yeah, the modes of nature are there for all living entities. Now, yeah. which, now that, what did you, where is the mode of goodness pre predominant? If the, if the mode of goodness is predominant in them always, and they will uh, lead to this real knowledge, is it right to say that? Not necessarily. They will, they will have some knowledge but not necessarily the full knowledge. Because you have to understand, as I explained also previously, and the knowledge, by knowledge people advance very slowly, it takes a long time. Now generally the process of knowledge depends on renunciation and detachment from the material world. The jnanis, those who are doing jnana yoga, cultivating knowledge, real knowledge, they have to cultivate detachment from the material world. But people, those people who are in the mode of goodness, they may simply be attached to the mode of goodness. They're simply comfortable there. They're not detached. So jnana yogi, he's detached. He has to be detached from the material world to go, to develop the the knowledge. You understand my point? Yes, Maharaj, fine. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, if a person is an atheist but he is into philanthropic work, what mode is he in and what is his destination, Maharaj? Well, philanthropic work doing good for us, yeah. what do you do for yes. them? What, do, what would you but do? But he's for... an atheist. Yeah, he's atheist. So he's feeding meat to the, to the other people. He's giving them meat, fish and eggs, or he's buying... Or maybe money. Money. Giving... money. He's helping with other things, but he does not believe in God. So what is his mode? And what is his destination? Well, it's, it's material. He's in the material world. And he's, you know, he's giving, if he gives money to others, it's a very dangerous thing to do because you give money to others and you don't know how they will use it. They may use it to buy alcohol, they may use it to buy meat. So you take karma, you take reactions for that. You give money to... Mm -hmm. So charity is never given indiscriminately. 
one should be very careful, very cautious about where and to whom he gives charity to. And so it's a dangerous thing to give charity, maybe in the mode of ignorance like that, because you give, you give charity to people, unqualified people. And he's an atheist himself, so he'll give charity to all kinds of atheistic people. Atheistic people generally are very attached to sense gratification, and so you don't know what they're going to do. So you're encouraging them with their sense gratification. You simply take more karma. It's not a good situation. Understand? Yeah? But I'm telling the person who's donating the money, what if he is an atheist, but he's doing a good job. I mean, he's helping, trying to help others. Maybe he might even help to build a but, hospital but he, or he may even give it. He doesn't know how to people. help. He doesn't know how to help others. That's a problem. Okay. He doesn't know how to help. And what he thinks is help is not really help. It's just giving them more karma and more putting them into more sinful activities, encouraging them in their sins. So, very dangerous. Understand? Yes, Prabhu, thank you, Maharaj. Hmm? Maharaj, thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Yeah, Maharaj, is it okay to accept charity or donations from such people who do not believe in God or who are atheists? I think that's what Mataji is trying to apply. People may be atheistic, but if they like to give charity to a devotee, very good. So they get benefit. They're, they're giving. Okay. Yeah. That will not accrue us for any karmic, bad karmic reactions. Not well, it. we don't take the money for ourselves. If we take the money for a spiritual purpose, then it's no, there's no harm. If we take the money for ourselves, for our own comfort, for our own living, then it's a problem. But if you use their money for some spiritual activity, for the service of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, just like we're putting on a big program or you want to print some books or something, and then we use their money for that, then it's beneficial for them. But if we take the money for ourselves, that, oh, they're giving charity to me, okay, that's good, and you know, I need some money extra, then we get karma, we're taking their karma. So we have yes, in fact, I remember there's a reference where uh, Prabhupada himself has told, uh, we, uh, you don't know how to make use of this money, you can give it to us, we will make use in the better concept of spirituality. Right, use it for Krishna, yes. So that's important, not for herself. Maharaji, just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, what does this, uh, what is actually uh, educated in the mode of goodness mean? What does it mean? Oh, we're going to hear about that. It means doing things like waking up early in the morning, bathing twice a day or three times a day. It means also going to temple, seeing the deity and hearing the scriptures, eating the right proper food, prasadam, this kind of stuff. Oh, okay, thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where are we? here we go. The results of can you can you all see this? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so the, here's a summary of the three modes, the different characteristics in the different modes. Uh, let's just go ahead. We want to see what Prabhupada's quote is. Prabhupada's quoting here, this is from the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita, which you'd gone over. So there's a, 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 an important quote there. He said, if therefore the mode of passion, instead of being degraded into the mode of ignorance, is elevated to the mode of goodness by the prescribed method of living and acting, then one can be saved from the degradation of wrath by spiritual attachment, <laughs> right? Spiritual attachment. So the prescribed method of living and acting, meaning, you know, as a devotee, living and acting as devotees, waking up early, chanting the holy name, worship the deity, read the scriptures, like that, following regulative principles, giving up the bad habits, hmm? 
here's the, the verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam saying translation as soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart the effect of nature's modes of passion and ignorance such as lust desire hankering disappear from the heart then the devotee is established in goodness and he becomes completely happy so again coming to the mode of goodness and here's another verse One who engages in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and comes to the level of Brahman. Okay, that's 1426. Another quote from the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada's explaining here what it means to come to the mode of goodness. He says here, this Krishna consciousness movement is directly offering the spiritual platform which is above the mode of goodness. The quality of goodness will automatically be there. Any person who is in Krishna consciousness, his quality of goodness, namely, he does not in, indulge in illicit sex, he does not smoke or even take tea or coffee. He does not eat any forbidden foodstuff, neither he takes part in unnecessarily gambling. So good character is immediately there. Okay? Very clear? What is the mode of goodness? Haribo? It's marriage. It's marriage. Okay. So nice quote yes, here. Mother. Nice quote. Yes, small doubt, Yeah? So, does the person progress step by step, like from the uh, ignorance mode, he goes to the passion mode and then to the mode of goodness and then goes to Shuddha Sattva, or he can go from any mode to Shuddha Sattva? Yes, he can go from any mode to Shuddha Sattva, but it's not so easy. It's just like, you know, it's, it's a long way to come up, you know, it's a big step up to come up to the mode of Shuddha Sattva, pure goodness. But you can do it. But, you know, we, we see, you know, people come to Krishna consciousness sometimes. They come out from the mode of ignorance and they take up Krishna consciousness. And for some time they do it, but some, often sometimes they also fall back. Difficult to maintain. That's the problem sometimes. So we have to be very cautious. So, so they keep fluctuating, you mean they keep falling down and they can again coming up and falling down and coming up? Yeah, they may do, or they may come back to the mode of goodness. We have to become established in the mode of goodness, you see. We have to get rid of the passion and the ignorance. So to actually come straight up to pure goodness, no, you may be on the level of pure goodness, but how long can we maintain that level before the passion or the ignorance comes, and then, oh, come back again, pure goodness, <laughs> like that, yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu, can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, I think, uh, coming back to Mataji's uh, question, that uh, from any move, uh, going to uh, Shuddha Sattva is possible, I think, is only because when, uh, when, when uh, other modes uh, get a special mercy of some devotees and, uh, and then connect to Krishna consciousness and they can uh, go to uh, Shuddha Sattva. Is it correct to say that? Yes. Yes, you need association. Somebody has to guide you how, how to come up to the level of pure goodness. We wouldn't know if we're in the mode of ignorance be very hard to know what we need to do to get out of ignorance, come up to pure goodness, <laughs> you know, to, to understand what is actually spiritual activity, how to maintain that level of pure goodness. It, it wouldn't be, it's not known by most people, no idea. Hmm? 
Okay, we'll just finish this here. We read this quote from the 16th verse of the 14th chapter. Again, Prabhupada's talking about the need for education. Because people have no education in actual knowledge, they become irresponsible. To stop this irresponsibility, education for developing the mode of goodness of the people in general must be there. And then, even if a small percentage of them just become Krishna conscious, then there's possibility of peace all over the world. Very nice. So, uh, we, you, we should also think how to cultivate the mode of goodness. First of all, we need to think, in what ways are we influenced by the mode of passion and ignorance? In what ways could we say we are ignorant? You know, we show here personal application. We are personally influenced by the mode of passion and ignorance. Maybe ignorance comes, you know, you gamble, or even you, sometimes you, you're with some pe people from the office and there's alcohol being served and you take one or two glasses. Like that, that's ignorance. In the mode of passion, you're driving, you can get very angry, or you, you lose some money somewhere, you get really upset, something goes wrong. And like this, we're, the mode of passion comes into great anger, and passion also, that very, working very hard with strong attachment to try to achieve material things. We give up chanting, no time for other things, just working, make money. So that's passion and ignorance. How to cultivate the mode of goodness? Practical ways. Make up the mode of goodness. Wake up earlier in the morning, more time to do chanting, more regular study of the scriptures, cleaning the house, putting everything away, keeping everything tidy. Also, that's the mode of goodness. Sometimes we accumulate so many things. So we should be careful not to collect, over, not to accumulate too much unnecessary, unnecessary items and goods. Try to keep it simple, simple living, high thinking. Right? That's the mode of goodness. So uh, we didn't really look at the end of the chapter, but you can see Arjuna asks a question there, text 21. He wanted to know about which, uh, he wanted to know about how the symptoms, first of all he wants to know the symptoms. The symptoms mean the internal characteristics of the person. That's described in text 22. And then he wanted to know also about the behavior. That comes in verses 23, 24, 25. And then he wanted to know how to transcend. That's 26. How to transcend. A very important verse, right? By engaging in devotional service. Mamcheo vaya bicharina. And there's a nice example there also, which comes in relation to the servant and the king. That one becomes Brahman. In order to associate with Krishna, we have to come to the level of Brahman. If we're not on the level of the Brahman, then we cannot associate with Krishna. We want to be with Krishna, we have to come up to the level of Brahman. The example is given, just like the servant of the king, he has to become qualified to associate with the king. So in the same way we want to be with Krishna, we want to enter the spiritual world, we have to also become Brahman. We have to get up, out from the modes of nature, then we can actually become Brahman. Okay? Hare Krishna Maharaj, one more doubt, sir. Can I ask, Madam? Yeah, please. So, if a person develops all these good quality and he's in the mode of uh, goodness, is there a chance that he will not, is there a chance that he, that he falls, he may fall down any, I mean, is there a chance of him falling down ever? 
Yes, if we're in the mode of goodness, but there's still some passion and ignorance there, then it's the nature of the modes that sometimes we'll be influenced by passion or ignorance. We can fall down, yes. So, and the only way in which you can come out from the mode of goodness, you have to go above the mode of goodness to the Vasudev level or Shuddha Sattva, that's only possible by engaging in devotional service. Okay, okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions there? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, I would like to ask, uh, this is my practical problem. However, best we try to be in the mode of goodness, sometime within a few fraction of seconds, our mood swings due to the situation at work or uh, child or family. How to remain steadfast in this mode of goodness all the time, Maharaj? Well, it takes practice, you see. Because we have been conditioned to the passion and ignorance, but it takes some time for us to come out of it. It's going to take a little practice on our own part. We have to see how much we're being influenced. When we start to understand that, you know, oh, I'm being over, I'm in the mode of passion, or oh, I'm in the mode of ignorance, and then we have to do something about it. We have to get out of it. Okay, I'm in the mode of passion, I need to stop, I need to go out and chant, or I need to sit down and read, I need to go to a temple, I need to just, you know, engage myself in some devotional service to get out of this passion, to get away from this ignorance. We have, the first thing is getting to know our own self. We start to know more about our own self and then we can get out of the passion and ignorance and then we can come to know more about Krishna. Right? First we have to become conscious because often people are not even aware that they're influenced by passion and ignorance. Ordinary people, they, they, they never even think about it. They're passionate or they're ignorant. They have no knowledge. But when we start to understand, oh, this is Raja Gun, this is Tamagun, then, okay, I want to do something about it. So that's the first thing, that we're aware of it. We become aware of our situation and we make some effort to get out of that mode of passion and ignorance. So that's very good. So coming to Krishna, you, coming to Krishna is a great help to us to, you know, and you know we want to try to come up to this level of the mode of goodness, controlling the mind and senses, and peace, being peaceful and being clean, and being honest, not lying and cheating and procrastinating, <laughs> doing all the nasty things, troubling people. Hmm? Yeah, and then final verse in that in that in the chapter there, Lord Krishna is saying that he is the base the basis of Brahman. Right? It's a nice verse. That he Lord Krishna is the basis of the Brahman. So we all, you know, to get, to come up to the level of Brahman means to come out of the modes, to actually transcend the modes. You don't have to wait till the end of life. We can do it in this, this very lifetime. Hare Krishna, is somebody trying to say something there? Okay, so one who, one who knows Krishna, then he will also know the Brahman. It's not that, and it's not that we have to first know the Brahman and then the Paramatma and then we go on to Bhagavan. No, we simply engage in Krishna's devotional service. And by engaging in the service of Krishna, then naturally we will come to the level of Brahman. And we will also know the Paramatma. Everything is included because we're, in, we're connecting ourselves in service to Krishna and Krishna is the Supreme Lord and he's the origin of the Brahman. The Brahman comes from the body of Krishna. The light coming from the body of Krishna is the Brahman. 
And the Paramatma is Krishna's expansion. So if we know Krishna, then we will also know Paramatma and Brahman. Is it all right? Everyone clear? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. So which mode are you in? When we're doing our devotional... Above, above uh, the mode of goodness. When you're above the... Right. When we're doing our devotional service, at least we're above the mode of goodness, right? We want... Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. Uh, um, Brahman is the soul. Well, Brahman is, that's one, one aspect of the Brahman, but the Brahman is also the effulgence, the light coming from the body of Krishna. We call it, we call it the Brahma Jyoti, the Brahma Jyoti. So in the spiritual sky, there is the Brahma Jyoti and all the planets are the spiritual planets, the Vaikuntha planets and Goloka, they're all there in the Brahma Jyoti. The Brahma Jyoti is this effulgence coming from Krishna. So the, the impersonalists, they, those who want to merge and to, they, to enter into the oneness, they enter into that Brahma Jyoti. That's also Brahman. We say the impersonal Brahman. And when Krishna kills the demons, like Kamsa, they go to the Brahma Jyoti. They also enter the Brahma Jyoti. So the Mayavadis and the demons killed by Krishna, they get the same destination. They go into the Brahman, the impersonal Brahman. Now we are also Brahman. We are spirit souls. And Krishna is also Brahman, but Krishna is Parabrahman. Krishna is the Supreme Brahman. We are tiny, we are tiny sparks of the Brahman. Hare Krishna, are you there? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, are you there? Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna? Yes. Hare Krishna, can, can you hear me? Hare Krishna? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Yeah, we got cut off, huh? Some yes, Maharaj. I think what you said for the last two or a minute or so, we missed out on, unfortunately. If you can just uh, rephrase that. Yeah, I was talking about the Brahman. I said Krishna is the Supreme Brahman. He's the Parabrahman. Tiny sparks of the Supreme Brahman. Like the, the spark coming from the fire. So we have the qualities of Krishna, but in different quantity. So we are Brahman and Krishna is the Supreme Brahman. We have a relationship with him. Krishna consciousness is to bring us into that relationship with Krishna, to reveal to us our relationship with Krishna. Are you there? Yes, Maharaj. <laughs> okay, I'm never sure if you're there or not. <laughs> so, yeah. Maharaj, uh, just one uh, observation. Um, your uh, battery was running a little low. I don't know if you need to connect it to the power outlet. What, my computer? Oh, let me see. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's a bit low, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I can, can make a difference to the to the transmission.